welcome Stephen Gilbert. It's great to have you here. Um, I just want to uh, give you a quick introduction here for the benefit of the viewers uh, and the listeners. Um, so Mr. Hilbert has been part of the, uh, the Oshin Biotechnologies for quite some time. And uh, you've served on the advisory board since its, its inception. Uh, you've been on several biotechnology advisory boards in the past, and you've been in the biotech space for 10 years, in the banking for 18 years. So it comes with plenty of experience in VP and uh, corporate development work. Just want to ask, um, welcome, by the way, and, and what got you involved specifically with Oshin? Well, it's an honor to be here, and thanks for the opportunity to speak on, on behalf of Oshin. Uh, to your question, it, you know, it, it is a funny space uh, to think about going from finance to biotech, but uh, years ago, I came up with a potential model for the biotech space and uh, with another company, and that sort of just got me as an investor involved and as an advisor involved in another company, and I found myself just enthralled by what's possible, how much impact you, a company can make but how much risk is involved. So finding ways to balance that risky investment with the actual end results that you're looking for and, and advancing science was something I was really drawn to. That's what kept me going. Yeah, it is pretty exciting times in, in biotech and science in general. Um, mm -hmm. It's certainly something I've been uh, keeping an ear to the ground, shall we say, on. Uh, I, I really do. I think that it's huge potential with um, regenerative medicine there. And so some of the amazing things you're doing to combat uh, the, the effects of aging is, is great. So but before we actually discuss how to combat aging and what Oshin is doing about it, how would you define uh, aging? Well, at Oshin, I think we take an approach where we're focusing on cellular damage, specific, specifically senescent cells. So um, oh, as we get older and as we age, especially when we reach after the age of 45, our, our bodies are really good at, at uh, our cells are really good at destroying themselves if there's a problem or the immune system is really good at clearing things out that shouldn't be there. But as we get older, the immune system gets tired and cells themselves get tired and get what's called senescence and damage to them. At Oshin, we're really focusing, focused specifically on clearing those senescent cells, allowing the body to naturally regenerate and having those, giving more room for those healthy cells to regenerate rather than have the, you know, be in spots where the senescent cells are taking up the room. So that's really what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's, a, that's a good introduction to what you do. Um, so how long, like, a, is there any other aspects of aging that Oshin is focusing on? That, that's the major approach at the moment, isn't it? Damage yeah, it really is. It, it's thought that, and, it's, and actually several studies by the Mayo Clinic, as well as our own internal studies uh, that we have still ongoing, show that if we, just by clearing senescent cells, specifically focusing in P16 and P53, yeah. uh, we can actually extend health span. Uh, and that's the key. I, I think we, we don't know how long aging can go, and, and there's talks about potentially you know, people living forever. We're really just focused on increasing our health span. And what we've noticed, at least in our studies, is we've been able to do so by at least 25 to 30 uh, percent in mice. And hopefully this also will translate into humans at some point down the road. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, thirty percent longer life, longer health span, should I say, would be good. And it's pretty important there to define the difference then between longer life and, and longer health span, because often people um, wonder if they did live for a long time, the you know the last third of their life might be um, pretty bad. They think that well, if I do live for a long time, I'm just going to live like a, like a very very old person for the last forty or. 30 years uh, so yeah you're right yeah and what's what's the joy in that you know it's not we're not just trying to expand your life your life we want to expand your healthy life as well what's the point on living longer if you just aren't functional and so you're absolutely right this is going to bring up a lot of debates and questions on what what that should look like right now we spend billions of dollars in the last week of life and really is that worth it is that worth the person that's there that's just clinging for dear life or is it, it just doesn't seem like it's the right solution if we were able to instead extend that person's healthy life and they die suddenly of some other natural cause that seems like the future that a lot of us would probably want and that's really what ocean is focusing on yeah absolutely and as a side effect of having like a longer healthy uh time people do 
will end up living longer because uh, the things that ravage um, people when they're older are also kill them. And, and the things that make them suffer are also the things that kill them earlier. Uh, so yeah, that, that's important. That's really important. So uh, do you think if, if we have a look at the bell curve of, of average lifespan, um, in the future when regenerative medicine does work, um, do you think the bell curve will just shift to the left or shift, shift forward a bit um, and have a sharp cut off at the end, or will there still be like a, a big sort of slide down, a gradual slide down? Yeah. That's a really good question, and, and a lot of I think scientists are, are really grappling with this. You know, groups at the you know, Sun's Research Foundation and the mm -hmm. Foundation are, are constantly trying to find ways to how do we extend life. And if you look at other ways like telomere extension or other things, that that may actually have an impactful uh, timeline impact the timeline of life in a significant way that we're uh, who knows right so I, it's hard to say where that bell curve would shift we're focusing just on senescent cells though and we're focusing on our therapies and focusing on the fact that maybe we can get them into humans with all the approvals necessary then i think yes if you're just focused on that you might see a shift in in that curve for a few, for a longer lifespan and a healthier lifespan mm -hmm. just if we're focused on senescence and senolytics in the senescent space Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So yes, these um, senescent cells have been dubbed zombie cells in the media. <laughs> kind of a cool name. But yeah, well, can, do you want to give a brief description of what they are and, and how they affect the body? Um, positively, I guess, you know, to reduce the, the risk of cancer in some cases, but also um, negatively in that they you know, hang around for too long since they don't die right. properly. They don't get out of there, right? They're just sort of stuck. Well, I mean, these are really important cells to have when in childbirth and in child rearing. I mean, senescent cells are constantly growing, and in, or when you cut yourself, like your body is designed to create certain senescent cells to heal yourself and wounds, and, and also when you're growing. So those are really important. We don't want to focus on that. As you age, though, we're, that's what we're really focused on: is the cells that are caused by aged and damaged cells that have resulted as of just years of work. And what tends to happen is these cells just sort of stick around and forget how to kill themselves. So really they're just stuck in space and they're releasing all sorts of uh, cytokines and, and inflammatory fluids. And what's been thought is that these, sense, um, these senescent cells are responsible for maybe over 180 types of age-related diseases, including arthritis, including cancer, um, and, you know, it could be even considered an Alzheimer's. So the, if we are able to go in there and take out these senescent cells, what seems to be happening is we're making room for healthier cells to regenerate. And all we're really looking to do is, is these cells know they're damaged, they want to die, but like a zombie, like to your point, they're stuck. They're just sort of stuck in the state and they can't do anything. And they're just taking up the space. And as more of them take up more and more space, you're, take, you're, you're, you're not allowing room for your healthy cells to continue to regenerate. So. Once we wipe them out, we do find that it's like a, a nicer neighborhood. The, the other cells like to move back in, and the healthier cells tend to move back in. And that seems to have effects not just only in health span and lifespan, but also for like maybe ailments as well. So the, the possibilities uh, could, be, could be huge, and there's a whole bunch of different applications that we, we look to, to apply this technology to. Our first is cancer, uh, focusing in solid tumors very effective at destroying those senescent solid tumors. And, and this is all targeted, right, isn't it? It's, it, it? In the sense, it's not just killing all, all the, uh, the zombie cells, it's uh, killing the ones that you want, is that correct? We, it's actually the opposite of what you would think would be the logical thing, targeting specific senescent areas. We certainly can administer the, um, the, uh, the application directly into the tumor or wherever, but what we're finding is that the, the technology that we use the programming that we use, uh, if we inject it, in, uh, it uh, with an IV, it finds where the senescent cells are throughout the whole body and throughout the whole system and goes after those aggressively. So we are working on our concentrations and, 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 and formulations for getting the ideal shot. For example, cancers tend to be more focused with P53, like the solid tumor cancers really get hit hard if we, if we gear it more with P53. For other ailments, P16 seems to be uh, a better better solution for a healthier, longer lifespan. And mm -hmm. now getting into your, your, your mouse study, yes, we do have a 40, uh, over 40 mice that we've uh, taken, we've aged them over two years. And what we wanted to do is see 
how long could these mice live if they're, you know, have a control group, if we administered one with P53, mm -hmm. if we administered one with P15, and then what if we did a dual therapy? Mm -hmm. uh, and what's expected is that, you know, the control mice, which they followed their bell curve, we, we had about 70 to 80% reduction in those mice. They died of natural causes of voltage. Oh, wow. That, that's, uh, that's but with, yeah, which is, which is normal. I mean, that, that, that you're expected of that. The P53 and P16 mice, mice actually extended their lifespan and their health span significantly and then started to follow the normal bell curve. But at least they, weren't, they were actually extending their mortality for a longer time. But what was what is and was and still is ongoingly very interesting. If we administered both P16 and P53, we've only lost one mouse. I think actually two finally, but there's a significant margin. In fact, we can't even calculate what the mortality is because they're so far ahead of their control mouse. Mm -hmm. So that so that that's a very interesting thing, and the study is still ongoing. The mice are still seem to be okay, mm -hmm. but I would. Very interesting data that we'll hopefully publish whenever the last mouse dies, which could be a while from now. So, mm -hmm. um, but right. what this tells us is that some combination really is valuable, uh, and and could actually have some impact on health span. Absolutely. And I look, the last I saw, um, I, I saw like a graph that you'd put out there uh, on some preliminary results, and it seemed as though the um, the control or the the ones that were given placebo were at 40 percent or you know there was a 42 percent left um and i think for the p for the for just the for the for the combo it was significantly higher like maybe maybe 90 or 90 something or 80 something percent there so that's looking pretty impressive so yeah we've lost i think one more mouse in the control and a couple more in the control and then p53 and p16 have slowly come down a bit mm -hmm. but the the combo therapy is still holding strong which is right. uh, very interesting for us yeah and so we'll see we need to be holding off <laughs> so. absolutely so this is something to watch everybody but who are we trying to convince here? I mean, it'd be great for the public to be convinced because then they'll start, you know, um, raising their voices, but also the scientific community. Who in the scientific community would you like to convince? What aspect of the scientific community do you think would be great to convince? Sure, I, I think, uh, you know, we're fortunate that we're not the first in the field. So uh, we have some competitors, well, not really competitors, but Unity Bio, for example, is now a publicly traded company focused in aging. And we, that's great for the that's great for the, all of us in the space because it shows that there's a viable uh, financial reason to look at this, and also it's getting more attention from serious science community as a result. So these are all positive things. I think the key is to show you have success as specifically combating uh, disease, and so we're we're not naive to think that. Uh, the, the FDA or all the other regulators are going to view aging as a disease in the short term. And that's going to be a long battle. What we know, though, is that most diseases of, are of aging. So if we can f uh, focus on the pathologies of aging, we can probably kill and, and target some really nasty diseases on the way. And that's why our strategy and our corporate strategy has been to looking at identifying areas in which we can have the biggest impact in the quickest time in humans. And we're really focused right now in solid tumors and cancer. One of our, our hopes is, and why we're raising funds right now vigorously, is to get into human trials by next year, to actually have our product in human beings. We've, we've been talking uh, to the powers that be at creating a 90-person trial for, for solid tumor cancers. And if we can get our phase one and phase two data to look like our, our non-human primate studies where in the fact that we tested 12 monkeys and they all survived the highest dosage 10 times the highest dose we'd ever give a human uh, we feel that if we can get past that toxicology then we open the doors for the industry to really focus in the age-related areas so to your to ask your question i think the whole community the, the cancer researchers the all doctors involved in age-related combat of disease uh, and sarcopenia and in they they are all trying to find ways to sort of go after these these pathologies individually. What we may be sitting on is, is an information system that allows us to go after a lot of them simultaneously. And that's what we're really, really excited about. So I guess we'd like to show first that we can destroy cancer and partner with existing therapies as well using our technology. And in so doing, we'll open the door for a whole bunch of other things, which will also have the side effect of probably extending your lifespan. Because by clearing the senescent cells that are responsible for those 
those diseases and those pathologies, we're able to uh, also in the process regenerate our own, our own stem cells, our own system to grow and live longer. So I think it's gonna be a combination of us talking to you know, doctors working in their specific fields and certain age-related disease, as well as those like the SENS Foundation, the Methuselah Foundation, they're really focused on broadening the scope and saying, look, age is a disease, let's focus on extending human life. It's gotta be a combination. To my mind, I think it'll be a hot button issue once people realize that it's not just a pipe dream that we can extend our healthy lives, but that it's a reality and that it, that it is um, a foreseeable future, actually in the near term. And I think that's important for people um, to, to get their interest up and to get them motivated to fund and, and uh, support these sorts of causes. Now, you've got the Methuselah Foundation, the SENS Foundation, and a number of other um, groups are founding investors in Oshin. So yeah, right. I mean, like, uh, like, how do you, how does all this fit together? Were you, uh, were the founders of Oshin speaking to Aubrey de Grey or, um, and, and the people from SENS and, and the people from uh, Methuselah beforehand? Yes, we're very fortunate. Our, found, our co-founders, uh, well, both Matthew Schultz and uh, Gary Hudson, who was our acting CEO until uh, Matt was able to divest from his other company and come in full time, uh, they met at an aging conference where Matt was speaking, and they were both attending a lecture together on anti-aging, and I think they were, that's where they were listening to uh, the work done by the Mayo Clinic. And Matt had an idea, like, you know, I'd do this differently. And thus began, like, Gary said, well, how would you do it? And then they went for cocktails, is what I understand the story to be, and talked about it on napkins. And, and then I guess they brought Dave Goebel of the Methuselah Foundation involved, and thus began the, the strategy. I was, I was aware of this back when they first started, because I was always talking to Matt and interested in what he's up to and advising on some of his business items here and there. And I said, this is exciting. And the strategy was to fill it or kill it quickly, just to fund the studies to see if we had anything to see if we could put our plasmid inside of a, a lipid nanoparticle and make this thing work. And it turns out it worked really well. <laughs> and so uh, we got some results uh, in cancer from the University of Alberta, who our chief science officer is the head, heads up the University of Alberta can, uh, Prostate Cancer Research Center in Edmonton. Edmonton, excuse me. And... Um, we did a ton of studies, uh, a lot of which were on prostate cancer, and the results were incredible. Like literally within 48 hours, we had almost complete reduction of a, of a giant prostate cancer with no apparent side effects. The mouse was alive two weeks later. And in fact, it, the, the studies were so crazy, we wouldn't even talk about it until we did it again and tested it like several other times to make sure what we were seeing worked and was really adequate. So once that happened, I got involved. Um, but that's really, we're really grateful once we have that information. I mean, the Methuselah Foundation, the SENS organization has been great. We've had, we've been very fortunate to raise our first two million with what I would call mission-driven investors, people that really want to see the space go. And we've just started to open up and, and broaden our horizons to other groups that have had cancers or, or people that really want to see the science. And we're still continuing to raise money um, quite quickly. Um, we're still pre, pre-series, we're still pre-money. We haven't even gone to our Series A, um, and we're a preclinical company, which, which I guess tells you that we're sitting on something pretty special. And I think that it tells you that the the community as a whole is really looking at this, going, this this could be the future of medicine. So, as a space, I think we're sitting in a really good time at a really good spot, and uh, we're very excited to be here, and really excited by the investors that we have so far. Uh, we're planning on doing a Series A and going into the clinic next. We'll need about $30 million to do that, but we plan on doing that by next year at the rate we're going, and, and fingers crossed that's going to happen. Great. Now, if yeah. people want to find out if they qualify um, as being an investor, um, how would they do that? And, and if these potential investors want to get in touch, how can they do that? Absolutely. Please check out our website, OceanBio, O-I-S-I-N-B-I-O.com. And on there is an info link at the bottom to contact us. We get back to that quickly. We obviously are uh, pre-money and uh, institutional sort of, um, we, we are only taking accredited investors at this time. But we certainly are open to anyone interested in the industry. We've had requests all over the world from doctors and, and family offices to, um, to individual people uh, wanting to know more about the space. So we really try to get back to you 
uh, as quickly as possible. But if you are interested in investing, it's typically in the United States as an accredited investor or as a part of a, a group of, of a fund, if you will, that's investing as a group of people. Um, that's typically how we see people get involved with us. So oceanbio.com, you can also reach out to me directly. Uh, my email is steven, S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot Hilbert, H-I-L-B-E-R-T at oceanbio.com. That's O-I-S-I-N bio.com. We're happy to talk to you and about the space. We're very excited about it. Oh, it's a very exciting space, absolutely. So in terms of like advocacy, I mean, like having these thoughts of results that you're getting now and potentially, and what it looks like, you know, if we, um, you know, extrapolate into the future, if your results go the way that they're looking, they might go, um, we might actually achieve something that's been dubbed um, robust mouse rejuvenation. The whole space of possibility really opens up, it seems to me. Oh, oh yeah. for sure. For, you're absolutely right. In fact, you, you know, I, get, I think the Methuselah Foundation gets the mouse prize with the whole goal of advancing the space. And what we're doing now, I guess, could be absolutely described as robust mouse rejuvenation. We don't have, the mice aren't dead yet, so we don't, we don't really have the ability to tell you much about it, but they seem to be outliving their peers for a significant margin as of now. Hopefully they continue that path. It's going to be interesting to see how long they actually survive and, 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 and what that span is. But we plan to actually raise more money to do more and more of these studies. But, you know, having 40 aged mice is not inexpensive. And then keeping them alive, well, at this point indefinitely, is also, you know, something we're looking to do. Wow. But uh, we have a lot more data on this, and, and hopefully it comes back in a, in a way that we think. And this will have impacts. I mean, if, if we start into humans, which we plan to by next year, there'll be a lot of questions on like, would this therapy, could this therapy be used for longevity and, and other things and who, who should get that and how? And that's mm -hmm. another interesting discussion to have, uh, I guess, with all of our team and all the, the powers that we as, we as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so, agree. I mean, like if, 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 it, if it is possible, um, you know, there are expenses in getting this, sort of technology, this therapy off the ground, it's expensive at first, but um, once, you know, a lot of the, the mist is cleared away and, and things become, uh, you know, uh, there's economies of scale, things do become cheaper. In, in general, it's how it's worked with other technologies. So, and um, I can't see any strong reason why that won't happen with uh, rejuvenation therapies. Yes, I think that, I mean, it really depends, you know, we're really focused on the science and getting this to work. Unfortunately, in, in the pharma space, as you well know, in the biospace, there's a lot of business that goes on the back end that can prevent people from getting medicines and, and marking up things. So uh, this is a discussion that's going to have to be considered as we move forward. And, and we're going to be interested involved in like who gets the therapy how much does it cost these are all as drugs come out these are the questions that face all of us mm -hmm. um, healthcare expenses in the United States are astronomical now um, most people a, a recent poll came out I was reading the New York I think it was New York Times that if someone had a $400 hit in their medical expenses that would wipe out their bank account for 89% of the population that that seems extravagant to me I'd like to see the data I didn't see where this the poll came from but it, that's a significant problem when you can't get access to in a, for, for adequate medical treatment for a decent price. Mm. So to your question, it's, it's, it's more complex than just what is our pricing going to be. I think it, it depends on who owns and controls the therapies at the end of the day and how much does it cost to get all the way through and, and what jurisdictions is it going to be in. Uh, these are all questions that play on a much larger scale uh, mm. that we are all going to have to talk about and discuss. Who you know, I think these are just as of now, outside of these therapies, it's important to have that discussion now on existing therapies. It just mm. seems like healthcare costs are getting out of control. Yeah. Well, um, on the positive note, it does seem like the sort of therapy um, that will make other healthcare expenses cheaper if it has the ongoing side effect or the flow on effect of um, not having as many downstream problems, shall we say. You start taking these regenerative. Uh, therapies and your body is in a better condition so it's less likely to be encumbered by some of the deliberating diseases of old age like uh, cancer and such so in a sense it's it's not 
a palliative approach really is it it's 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 more like a fundamental like repair approach if you leave your car if you don't get your car serviced for a long time and then it starts to break down and then you have to spend a whole lot of money trying to fix it in the last few months of its life that's the problem you know if you yeah, keep it in great, great analogy. yeah yeah you know, this is one that all yeah, the great yeah. Uses all the time yeah, no, you're 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 exactly right. It's about maintaining the car, right? So someone came. I think this was at a conference I was at recently. With someone was saying the, I think it was Aubrey de Grey, in fact, that was saying that the Ford Model T. There are some that are still in existence. They weren't designed to be along this line. People took meticulous care of them, right? Mm-hmm. Constantly making sure the parts are working and that the things are well oiled, and they can. And if they do, they can outlive their planned obsolescence. And, it's no different with aging. You're absolutely right. And to your point, it should really reduce the medical costs and expenses that we currently have to try to treat disease or prolong that last week or two or month of life in a, in a, with high morbidity. I, I, th- I think you're absolutely right. It could really impact the costs in a positive way if we can get these therapies out into the masses. So, so say like, um, you know, how would you get the, these therapies out to the masses sooner rather than later? How much money um, do you think you need in order to really uh, get this going? Well, that's a really good question. Right now we're faced with the issue of scalability. You know, there's only so many of us at, at, at a certain cost. More money solves that problem. We're able to train people quicker, get up to the, and open up different places. So right now we're focused, like I said, extremely on cancer. That. That's, that's our way to get our therapies into humans to show proof of concept and then open the door for hopefully other larger investment that can take us to a much larger company that can go after multiple different types of things. We also have a skin care product because humans are vain. Who wants to live you know, to 120 if they look that way? <laughs> so unfortunately, that's also a very big business too. So we're, we do have a skin division that we're looking at as well, focusing on, on skin aging. Uh, we have, we're looking at ocular degeneration, um, brain, um, yeah, central nervous system types of things as well. All these things we'd love to explore and all that we can if we just had a significant amount of money. I think, you know, if, if, we, could, if, if we could raise another 30 million right now, that would all go into the cancer space. And we've designed the company for that to be successful. Once it is successful, the money that feeds back will fund all the other types of things we can go after. So it's, um, and reward the investors in, in, the, onco- in the oncology space uh, significantly. So we've sort of designed the company to be a, a discovery platform where we can have multiple, multiple companies developing and multiple applications. We just need the money to be able to scale up those teams and get the, get the research and science going. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so like it, uh, it, it is interesting though, the different approaches to funding and the different approaches to research some would say that like um it may be a distraction to work on uh more of the short-term spin-off technologies what what are you guys doing to make sure you keep the eyes on the fundamental long-term goal or you know the fundamental research instead of um veering off and turning into just just only a skincare um company or something like that Sure, Adam. No, that's that's a very valid point and concern. Uh, we we are laser focused on getting our longevity treatment into humans. That's the number one thing. We started this whole company based on that. What became evident very quickly was that in order for us to be in humans, we weren't going to do it on longevity because just the powers that be in the United States don't view aging as a disease. They just don't. So we're not going to get into any drugs or FDA approvals, and we are technically a senil- senolytic, right? So it's a technically a gene therapy, even though it's not really a gene therapy, it focuses on the cellular level. We need FDA approval. So how do we get into humans if we don't have a disease to cure? Well, the good news is there's over 180 we can go after. And the reason we chose cancer is because one of our investors at the time, um, you know, was facing a stage four prostate cancer. I, I believe since then he's passed, unfortunately, can go fast enough. There are so many people that we could talk to and save and go after in the cancer space we thought that's that's where we have to go first and we have the data and we've got we know it works so why not focus on that the byproduct of getting this into a human for a specific drug therapy allows us to explore the longevity space whether it's jurisdictional or not in the united states or overseas it opens the door because if we get the toxicity data back and it shows that it's it's non-toxic and it's effective that opens the door for multiple other drugs, diseases, 
And then in the process, if to your point earlier, if we're focusing on eliminating these diseases, we're ultimately focused on increasing our lifespan, right? So, so it's, it, it, our, our, our strategy is hand in hand, we believe, and we are laser focused on getting this into humans for the benefits of all diseases, for benefits of all humankind, I guess, and, and longevity. So hopefully that, yeah, it would be easy to get sidetracked and focus on spinoffs, but really the main strategy is to focus on what's the biggest, lowest hanging fruit we can go for right now to get the biggest bang for a buck and fund all our future endeavors in the space. So well, that's the plan. That, well, that's a great plan. But do you think people are ready to embrace like um, significant increases in health span? It, it, it seems like it, it, it inhabits a space in people's mind for science fiction or fantasy. But, you know, for, for, for a lot of people, it's just not a reality to them that this, this possibility exists. If, like, you've got, like, significant evidence or, you know, that does seem as though these mouse studies are doing really well, how do you think the people people will react? Are people ready for this? Are people ready for a long life? Well, it's a good question. I, you know, these are these are things that we wrestle with every day. Um, I, you know, the, the organizations that we talk about, Methuselah Sands, have done a great job at trying to get this out there over the last 10, 15 years to try to like even take this seriously. And they 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 sort of paved the way for us and took on all of that brunt. <laughs> I think in the early years. And we're very grateful they did. Even to this day, I think you're, you're, to your point, people don't believe it. It's too good to be true. But it's just the science is going so fast right now. And it's exponential. It's unheard of what we can see with our microscopes. And we can actually see cancer moving. We know where it goes. We know where it gets stuck. We can, we can actually see it. It's really like science fiction now when you go to the lab and you see these things and then when you see the results you're just that's like we said we were even shocked we didn't think it was true so we had to test it over and over again before we could even think about what do we have here with the fact that we've mapped the whole human genome the fact that computers are catching up and figuring things out i think it's just a matter of time now where we all have to realize that longer lifespans are probably an inevitability in the, in the next 10 to 15 years Wow. And, you know, as Aubrey would say, you know, you just got to stick around long enough to make sure these advances get there quick enough, right? Mm -hmm. And that, and so hopefully we'll be one of the pioneers in the space, Ocean and, and our, and our spin-out company in cancer, Oncosenex. Yeah, I saw uh, that be, one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Oncosenex is, we rebranded because people were getting, it was on Ocean Oncology, but Oncosenex is its own subsidiary. And to your point, people aren't ready for the longevity, but they are certainly ready to cure disease. So that's how we we are curing disease using a new technology, one that happens in your life. <laughs> but we're going after the disease first, and I think that's the way we have to frame things now at this at this stage in our in in our human evolution, I guess you could say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, like exactly, you're doing you're curing disease, you're reducing suffering. It's medicine. It's therapy. It's not some pie in the sky, you know, um, immortality pill or fountain of youth. It's not That's that. Right. It it what you're doing is actually, you know, getting your hands dirty, doing the research, and focusing on real things, and 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 focusing on real results. And that's very very promising. And that's that's the reason why I, I reached out to you guys. I've I've read some of the interviews you've conducted before, and um, read some of the articles like on fightaging.com um, and and around the place and uh, yeah I, I spoke to Aubrey de Grey I did an interview with him earlier this year and he um was very passionate about like achieving what I was talking about before robust mouse, mouse rejuvenation therapy there and thought that the rejuvenation um yeah the, the therapies were going very well indeed and so I'm so happy that there's a lot of like uh, people focusing on this and especially I'm very excited about the results you've been getting so far. So I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing how long these, um, the, the, what's the P16, P53 uh, mice, uh, how long they'll live but how long, and also how long they're going to stay healthy for. Right. Do you think there'll be a yeah. sharp cut off at the end? Like, like, like a, once they do get, Beyond a certain point, there's the therapies. Yeah, they'll, they'll start dying pretty quickly. Or do you think they'll just? Yeah, I think so. One of the issues you face with you know mice and 
not a lot of places give aged mice or they're hard to find and come by number one. Number two, there are certain types of genetic predispositions that these animals have already. And so the ones that we had to sac, we actually had to sacrifice because they were developing uh, certain legions, things like that, not related to any of the therapy. So it just, but that's part of what happens with certain mice of this genetic. This. So, so I guess we need a lot more samples and a lot more data is really the bottom line. Tests, yeah. If you find naturally grown ones, if you can find other, you know, source other mice and just sort of get a big smorgasbord of, of different types of mice, even to see how that works, that would be interesting to us. Mm. You know, what's interesting in our primate studies, we got a, a big smorgasbord of different um, monkeys because they were all different types of African green wild monkeys that were an invasive species on the island that we were at. So these were going to be sacked anyway. They just happened to build a medical research facility. So all mm. these monkeys were old or new and had diseases or not. And so that's a really good sampling of, you know, what a human population could be when you're treating. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're excited to continue these, these mice studies. We're excited to report the data back to, to you and to fight aging and, and other groups as well to report on um, as, as more develops. But as of now, we, we can't report anything because they're, they're still living. Mm -hmm. uh, and they seem, seem healthy. They're still eating. Um, well, that's a great thing to report. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm yeah. just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully, uh, they, you know, that's just one, one area and one study. I think what will be really telling is as we fight disease using our technology, then we'll start getting real results and, and being able to analyze over time, you know, patient outcomes. And mm. through that longevity, health span, et cetera. Mm. There's a lot to it. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, I mean, I... I come at this from a lot of angles. My, uh, I was initially interested in a lot of this through science fiction. A lot of the possibilities of science and technology inhabited part of my mind that was there for, you know, um, science fiction. I'd be interested to hear how, like, um, science fiction or inspiring stories in science has um, driven you and other people at Oshin. No, that's, that's a very good yeah, point. I mean, if you think about our future as humans, it's probably outside of this planet at some point. We have to live long enough to do it. And in fact, it's funny you mentioned that our, Gary Hudson is, is a rocket scientist on our team by trade. And I, I believe work with Elon on, on rockets. Don't quote me on that. But one thing we have been exploring is a, a potential to partner with NASA and maybe even SpaceX. As we go out into Mars and go out into space and colonize with humans, there's going to be exposed to a ton of radiation in there. And radiation causes a lot of damage and can create a lot of senescence. So maybe there's an opportunity for you know, us to alleviate some of that damage as you're traveling. We don't know. But it, it certainly isn't outside the realm of possibilities to think that that could be something we look to in the near future as we approach you know, humans being in Mars in probably our lifetime in the next 10 to 15 years. So if, if we get past this next stage, if we can focus on that, that would be awesome. And that would bring that science fiction almost to more of a reality. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this seems like it's pretty important to uh, hurdle to get over is that keeping astronauts healthy in space, in deep space, where there's a lot of radiation and people don't think about it. You, you, you can't just go out there in a, in a tin can and, and expect to be healthy. It's not the Earth. There's not a massive atmosphere in between, like, you know, space and us if we're just in a, in a, like a spaceship with minimal shielding. Right. So yeah, right. in terms of like rejuvenate, getting the body um, able to cope with radiation levels that we haven't historically needed to cope with in our, in our ancestral environment is very important. Absolutely. And it's going to be a combination, to your point of science fiction, it's going to be a combination of material sciences and, and then body. Like what, what are we going to do to keep people healthy and, and what kind of technologies in the biospace can we work on to help shield? It's not inconceivable that we might be able to find ways to protect our human bodies uh, using genetic uh, therapies, right, to, to focus on uh, different things that will help like, keep muscles strong or, or keep our bones intact, right? We're, without gravity, we're going to suffer a lot of uh, diseases that could be related to aging uh, mm. faster. So yeah. if there's, there could be a tremendous opportunity in the space program for Ocean and Oncocenics down the road. And yeah. it's, it's exciting times for sure. Absolutely. And I'm so impressed to hear that um, you've got people speaking for to NASA. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, that's... we're talking about it. We haven't officially done anything oh, okay. yet. Oh, yeah, 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 These are, uh, but these are, these are talks that we're discussing internally, and yeah. certainly, uh, uh, there could be some conversation going forward in the near term. So, 
So it certainly yeah. sounds like an uh, like a, a logical direction to take for, for NASA and keeping their astronauts healthy, um, you know, outside of the gravity well and outside of the atmosphere. That that's for certain for sure. So yes. All power to you. There's a lot of cell damage, one way or the other, that's going to happen out there, and we'd like to be helpful in uh, alleviating some of that damage yeah. for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Mm. Yeah. I guess with your role as, um, you know, like a, a, in, in corporate development, um, what areas of corporate, like uh, of the corporate environment, do you think you're going to become more interested in this as time goes on? Um. Let's see if I understand. So the interest, like in terms of the biotech space or just yeah. in general? In general. Well, 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 yes, because uh, I don't know very much about that particular space myself. I was hoping that you could like um, uh, let me know which areas of, of this space that you think are worth targeting. Um, of course, I think the biotech space are going to be interested in this, right? Sure. But um, yeah, are there any other relevant spaces that you think would be interested in um, developing this in some way that I don't quite understand yet? <laughs> no, sure. Well, it's interesting. The corporate develop. I view my role as a lot of times a translator and just a communicator, right? Mm. Um, a lot of industries such as technology, bio biotechnology, engineering, you've got really smart people with very complex things going on that could change the world and probably will. Sometimes they're not the best communicators. We're very fortunate that we have excellent communicators. Matt Schultz is one of the best I've heard. He can break, make things so complex sound so easy. So we're fortunate there. But in the space, a lot of times you don't have that. So we're lucky. Um, I think corporate development as a role, its most important part is to really make sure that the science is getting to like yourself, your, your viewers, your people, so that people understand what's going on in, in layman's terms, if you were, because I'm a layman myself. I want to make sure I understand the science enough to see why it's valuable, what impact it will have, whether it's uh, building you know, a new technological platform, whether it's getting better solar and, and getting off grid, or whether it's biotechnology with life saving you know, things. Like if you hear about CAR T, there's so many things in CAR T to know about. What does it mean? How do I get involved? And, which group should I focus in, right? So that's that's really, I think, corporate development's role is to basically make sure they're, they're telling the story correctly, they're getting out there in front of the people that can help fund it and grow it. And I think that's where the biotech industry is ripe for more individuals in marketing and, and sales even, where they can do that translation and get those, those, those sources out there of funding so that we can advance these sciences faster. I think that's the biggest thing you've got you've got too many things to do you're working on the science you're scaling a team you're dealing with the regulators and then you've got to go raise money <laughs> there's just there's only so much time of the day so from the corporate development standpoint i think having a good corporate development group in any startup is, is critical to its 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 success you, you got to have it for the funding to move things forward uh, at least in a startup as it gets into a bigger space i'll let you know <laughs> so that changes Absolutely. but uh, when the rubber hits the road, in, in real terms, you need money to actually fund the experiment. They just don't happen in the vacuum. We're not at the stage where you have like, a, you know, an all powerful super AI doing all the experiments for us that we don't need to pay and, and everything like that. There's a lot of procedures. There's a lot of uh, groundwork that needs to happen. And we need to, yes, you, you guys need the money. I mean, like, uh, and we'd like to see that happen. Well, one last comment, Ed, I'll, I'll leave everyone with is that, you know, you think about, Wealthy investors or institutional investors that give a lot of money to institutions to further science. Those are critically important. Where I think the most important thing to look at in the next several years is areas where you can actually take those research pieces and actually incorporate them and, and make them into a product. And companies like Oncocenex and Ocean are doing that right now. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like a different type of investment, right? I mean, yes, there's the financial reward. Hopefully the drug goes well and you make a lot of money and all that. But really, I think the people that are drawn to us are really looking for the therapies in themselves. Like what, how quickly can we get use of this? I think we're going to see a shift in, in people's values to more uh, values focused investing on how, how can I make an imp like impact investing? And, I, and we're very fortunate to be uh, attracting those types of investors who are mission driven, who happen to have a lot of money. Some of them who happen to be larger institutions and we really appreciate having them on board. We appreciate their guidance these people have been successful business entrepreneurs themselves in their own right and have brought their own companies public. Having that has been critical and will continue to be. And, and, and who's to say that we won't be the next publicly traded company at some point, but 
all that's great from a corporate side, but what the key I think is, is the value. What are we getting? How soon can we get this product into people and what impact will it have on humanity? And that is, I think is what gets all of us up at Ocean and Oncosynics every day. So, um, so I, we really are excited to, to, to move it forward and anything your, your constituents can do to help us do that, we, we greatly appreciate it. And we greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak to you, Adam. This has really been a wonderful opportunity. Thank you for yes, reaching out. Absolutely, Stephen. It's been wonderful speaking to you, and I'm very interested in the future of what you guys are doing. So I'll be keeping, like, a, yeah, I'll be keeping abreast of what, like, the developments you're doing and the, the results that you publish. So thank you absolutely. so much. Absolutely. Make sure you're on our mailing list, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah. And anybody else who wants to get, get on the mailing list, you know how, just go to the website. I'll put all the details in the description of the video once it's up there. So, yeah, um, it's been fantastic talking to you, and I wish you all the best. And maybe, hopefully, I'll see you at a conference down the line. I'm sure we will, Adam. I appreciate it. Good talking with you. Thanks Good so much. You. you too. Bye for now.